I'm just waiting to come back from the commercial break. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I know. Got it. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the committee meetings for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Uh, I would like to remind the members of the board that are online that in order to have a quorum, they should continue to keep their videos showing all the time, please. And uh, my name is Fred Fadias, and I'm the chairman of the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. And it is now 9.03, and we're calling the committee meetings to order. I uh, would like to also announce that on October 19, 2021, uh, Governor Greg Abbott appointed Dr. Daniel Wong to the coordinating board. And I've appointed uh, Dr. Wong as a member of the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. I will formally introduce our new member at tomorrow's board meeting. I would now like to pass the gavel to uh, Mr. Welcome Wilson to officially call the meeting of the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics to order. Mr. Wilson. Great, thank you, Chairman. Um, uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Welcome Wilson, Jr. I'm the Vice Chair of the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. Uh, it is 9.04 a.m., and I would like to call the January 26, 2022 Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics meeting to order. Uh, this meeting is being held via live broadcast. Uh, before we begin, I would like to take this opportunity to welcome those joining us via video conference and ask that you observe the following etiquette. Please state your name before you speak, mute your phone when not speaking, and please keep background noise to a minimum. Uh, members, when I call your name, uh, please announce uh, present. Uh, welcome Wilson, Jr., Vice Chair, President. Uh, Fred Farias. Present. Richard Klimmer. Present. Uh, Robert Present. Dahl. Uh, Present. Sam Torn. Present. Daniel Wong. Present. And Matthew Smith, our student representative ex officio. I don't know if Matthew's on yet. All right, please, uh, please record in the minutes that we have a quorum. Uh, members, I would like to welcome Dr. Daniel Wong to the committee meeting. Uh, Chairman Farias will officially announce him tomorrow at the full board meeting, but I want to acknowledge and welcome him uh, today. Dr. Wong, thank you for, uh, for your service. Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item number two. Consideration and approval of the minutes from the October 20th, 2021 committee meeting. Members, do I have a motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved. Thank you. Motion by Mr. Torn. Do I have a second? A second. Uh, thank you. Uh, any discussion? Uh, those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 Uh, uh, any opposed? Uh, hearing none, the motion passes. Agenda item number three is public testimony on agenda items relating to the Committee on Innovation, Data, and Educational Analytics. Do we have anyone registered to testify? Uh, we do not. If so, we will move on to the next agenda item. Agenda item number four is consideration and approval of the consent calendar. Members, there are no items on the consent calendar for consideration uh, this morning, so we will continue to the next agenda item. Agenda item 5A is the 60 by 30 text data insight overview of proposed methodologies to inform goals and targets for credentials of value and student debt. Dr. David Troutman, Associate Vice Chancellor and Chief Data Officer for Institutional Research and Advanced Analytics for the Office of Institutional Research and Analysis at the University of Texas System is joining us today and will provide a brief presentation and be available to answer any questions. Ms. Lori Fay, uh, Deputy Commissioner for Data Analytics and Innovation will be available to also answer any questions. Uh, this item is uh, for informational only. Uh, Dr. Troutman, uh, 
Hold on you, please. Great, can you hear me okay? Great. Yes. First, I wanna uh, thank, um, thank the chairman and the committee for allowing me the time to present you today on the work that we've done over the past uh, several years. And actually, we're gonna focus on the, uh, the first uh, last few months. I also wanna thank uh, Commissioner Keller and Chancellor Milliken for creating this research collaboration between the University of Texas System and the coordinating board. It's been um, such a great experience to work with the commissioner, his leadership and his analysts on this effort. So today I wanna to discuss with you the possible opportunities to measure credentials of value. For the past, for the past 10 years or so, I've really dedicated part of my career to focusing on linking higher education data with earnings outcomes. I've done this for several reasons, but just a couple to point out. One, just on a personal note, I truly have experience and reap the benefits of higher education as a first generation student where you know, I, I reflect and it's sort of branded on my brain that my conversation with my mother about filling out the FAFSA and going to college and her saying, just get a good job, just focus on your work. And I, but I told her, I said, but I wanna explore my opportunities. And so I was determined. So, and I kept on going after a bachelor's to a master's to a PhD. So I, I personally have seen the, the impact on my life higher education has had. And then second, you know, over the several years, we've seen in a personal attack on higher education. And so it's on us to really think about how we can create a positive narrative arc about how students can reap the benefits of higher education. Next slide, please. So what do we know from national surveys? So in 2019, Gallup uh, released a survey um, and they'd asked participants to think about their positive ratings of college. And what we do see is that in 2019, 51% of US adults believe college is very important. However, that 51% has declined dramatically compared to the, uh, an identical survey sent out in 2013, where uh, adults indicated 70% found it to be very important. And I think more alarming than this, when you break it out by age groups, and you look at young adults, ages 18 to 29, we see that only 41% of those young adults believe that college is very important to them in 2019 compared to a, a much larger percentage of 74%. And so we truly need to understand what's happening. I'm also, uh, we get a sense that during COVID that these, these perceptions of positive ratings have even more declined. So we just have to keep a pulse on this to make sure we better understand what's happening. Next slide, please. The, the National Center for Education Statistics has released two studies that I think are really important to really better understand those perceptions of higher education. In 2018, um, NCES conducted a study and they'd asked high school students and their parents to estimate their cost of college. So they just had an open-ended question and they asked, how much do you think college costs with tuition and fees per year? And what they found is that 57% of all participants, both high school and students, uh, high school students and parents overestimated those costs. And when you look at it by the numbers, students overestimated it by $10,000 and parents overestimated it by $8,000. So that's rather alarming. And, and they actually did some follow-up conversations and interactions with some of the participants. And there was a large confusion between sticker price versus net price. And then a study that was just released this month was examining, they asked students who are 11th graders um, whether or not they agreed or disagreed with, even if I get accepted to college, your family can't afford to send you. And what they did, which was really interesting, is they followed those students over time to see whether or not students who responded to that question actually enrolled in college. And what we find with those results um, are pretty dramatic, especially when you think about, um, they ask parents to report their, their educational obtainment. And what we do see is that parents um, 
who have a high school diploma or less, and where students said that their parents, their family couldn't afford it, only 55% of those students were found enrolled somewhere in higher education, whether it be a two-year, four-year or credential. Um, and you can compare that against uh, parents with a bachelor's degree or graduate degree. We do see if they viewed it as they could afford it, over 90% uh, of those students were found enrolled three years later um, from that, that junior year in high school. So we truly, we, we need to really understand how we can help them understand the true cost of a net cost versus the sticker prices that, that are displayed. Next slide, please. Another thing that's really pushing this, this attack against higher education is the media and really understanding the media headlines that are this clickbait associated with telling a story about higher education. There's something that we can never get away from, and that's the total amount of student loan debt currently, which is at $1.7 trillion. However, earlier this week in preparation for this presentation, I Googled the term student loan debt. And these are the types of uh, headlines that were coming up in the Google search. Meet a first generation gra college grad with 250,000 in student debt. You know, 36% of US millennials say that student loan debt prevents home ownership. And who wants to solve this student loan crisis? And then we, so it's this sort of perception versus reality of what's actually happening within the state of Texas. And, and more interesting, during this week, when I go back to my the search engines or I go to social media sites, I'm starting to see more stories now on student loan debt. So that algorithm has fed into my search history. And so it's sort of, it's feeding that perception of, oh, I really couldn't afford to go. And so once again, we have to fight against those perceptions and make sure that they understand the realities of what, what those costs are. Next slide, please. And so that's why it's so important to think about measuring credentials of value. And I'm so excited that uh, Commissioner Keller had asked me to participate with them to really explore the opportunities to measure credentials of value. Next slide. And in doing so, I, I wanted to, we wanted to reflect on the inventory of what's currently happening nationally. So nationally, we know that Department of Education's college scorecard has linked education data with IRS data for those who have completed a FAST and are receiving federal financial aid, and they've released dashboards associated with earnings outcomes by program. Um, we've all heard of Raj Chetty's Opportunity Insights efforts to really think about mobility rates, um, the percent of students from low-income families and achieving economic success. And I think this is a really exciting construct because I always think about students who are, are, are coming to us and their family households are around making around $30,000 a year. And what we see is some students that are completing their degree as early as their first year, they're doubling their family's household income by making $60,000. That's a huge success. And it really has a ripple effect within their generations within their family. And then there's other efforts like the post-secondary employment outcomes really matching earnings data with educational data. And so there are 20 states participating, including the, the coordinating board participating in that national effort. And then lastly, there's a report that was released just a few months ago on post-secondary value commission. So this has been something that Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has dedicated a lot of their resources and time to really explore matching the benefits of higher education and putting that in context with earnings using the American Community Survey. Next slide, please. And then there's also some great work from Georgetown Center for Education and Workforce where they've demonstrated median lifetime earnings by credential. And we've always heard of this sort of million dollar construct of if you complete a bachelor's degree, you have a, a benefit of additional million dollars in lifetime earnings. But this is showing you using American Community Survey data how lifetime earnings do differ based on the credential. So compared to a bachelor's degree of 2.8 to a high school diploma, which is 1.6 million. Next slide, please. However, we have to also consider that there are differences in lifetime earnings. There's a number of factors impacting that. So we, if we hone in and look at the chart to the left and look at the associate's degree, the, the left bubble indicates the 25, 25th percentile. So at least 25% of students are estimated to make 1.4 million after they've received um, an associate degree during their lifetime of work. However, the top 25% is at 2.9 million. 
And so there, that's a, a pretty broad range. You can also see the broad range with professional degrees as well, from 2.9 to 8.4 million. And so we also, we have to consider those factors that are impacting those differences. So workforce needs, so sort of the supply and demand based on an occupation. We, we have to consider cost of living and how it might differ from Austin to El Paso to Dallas to Houston. We have to consider the major that they're, uh, they're receiving their degree in, their occupational salaries. We know that there are gender differences in earnings outcomes. We also know there are race ethnicity differences in earnings outcomes. And then we also have to take into account any additional credentials they might have obtained after they've received their, their first initial degree that might have a positive impact on their earnings outcomes. Next slide, please. We've done a lot of work at the UT system trying to link our earnings data with our student information and follow them over time. So these are actual earnings of those students who are staying in Texas. And we broke this out by race, race ethnicity. And what you can clearly see is that there are, there are very few differences early on for one to three and even five years outcomes. But as the years go on, year 10, year 15, there are broader differences in earnings outcomes by race ethnicity. When we look at Asian students in the orange at $78,000 at year 10 versus whites in the purple at 66 versus Hispanic, who's in the dark purple at $56,000. So there can be a little bit of more differences as the years go on. Next slide, please. And then we also have to take into account the industries that students are working in. So these are actual students we follow them over time with their first year and their 10th year within Texas employment. And we've identified their industries they're actually working in. And I know there's a lot of information here, but I do wanna, uh, wanna hone in on a couple of industries. So educational services, so that's K through 12, two year and four year um, sectors. What we do see is that there's a dramatic difference in um, those working uh, by gender. So 32% of females are working in the K through 12 two year and four year versus 16% for males. We also see URM, so those are African-American and Hispanic students are working at a much higher rate in those industries than non-URM. And we, we do know in the educational services, there's a, a big difference in earnings outcomes compared to let's say manufacturing or finance and insurance or professional scientific. So just acknowledging that there are different areas and where our students are going in and that differs from women, men, and uh, underrepresented minorities. Next slide, please. And so with all that said, really just trying to place educational benefits and costs in context. And I think there's a great opportunity to do that in, this, in Texas. From my perspective and how I interact with my colleagues around the nation, Texas has some of the most comprehensive data in the nation. It's really fantastic. And the coordinating board has done an amazing job over time to gather educational data in a standardized way across all of our institutions, and then working with the Texas Workforce Commission to link those data. And so it's really that important case of linking those data and highlighting student investments in higher education and the return of those investments. Next slide, please. So based on your current 60 by 30 debt goal, so by 2030, undergraduate student loan debt will not exceed 60% of first year earning wages for graduates of Texas public institutions. While I think this was an important goal setting standard several years ago, what we do know is we've learned from our experiences with wrestling with these data. I'm not an economist by trade, but I've become a pseudo economist based on my, my passions to do this. And, and what we do know by working with students and interacting with them and talking to them about things, this metric isn't translatable to them. Um, it's not meaningful to them. Even when I try to produce a, a tool called CQT to look at earnings outcomes with debt, I would provide them annual earnings. Even annual earnings isn't as meaningful to them as a monthly earnings. And so, that one, I remember one student raising their hand during a, a focus group and they said, well, you know, I pay my cell phone bill by month. I'd rather have this by month. And I'm like, well, just simply divide by 12. And they're like, well, can't you do that for me? I'm like, sure, I guess. <laughs> but in doing so, it really provided the opportunity to think about how we can educate them on the 
the average loan repayment per month and not just providing a sticker shock of you owe $25,000 in debt um, after you graduated. So really that, that interaction has really created a different framing of how we can disseminate this information out to the public to better understand um, you know, net price of something and, and repayment versus the sticker shock. Next slide, please. And so with that said, during our conversations and journey of looking at the data, it's really thinking about moving beyond the original goal and thinking about the percent of no debt and manageable debt. What would be manageable debt for a student based on uh, the ratio of their monthly loan repayment to their monthly gross earnings? And so what we did is we used the information from the coordinating board to calculate loan repayments. And we used the assumption of a 10-year repayment plan plus 5% interest of that payment plan. And then we took into account their annual earnings and divided that by 12 to understand how much gross earnings they would make monthly. And we created that ratio. And then the US Consumer Financial Protection Bureau indicates that it's risky borrowing if you've exceeded a 10% threshold. So if more than 10% of your loan payments accounts for your monthly gross, then there's a problem there. There, there. there needs to be some attention to figure out how it can be manageable and be less than that 10% threshold. And so with the metric itself, it's, it's, a, it's accounting for those students with no debt, which is fairly high, right? I mean, that's something important to acknowledge. And then untangling those students who have manageable debt, so they're below that threshold versus unmanageable debt. So for example, let's say that a student graduated in, let's say, journalism from an institution. They owe $25,000 in debt. If we do the 10-year plus 5% interest, that's around $265 a month. And then what we can do is we can link the, that those data to figure out how much their first year, their third year, their fifth year earnings are and create a, a monthly uh, account. So let's say that they make 30, let's say $36,000 for their first year out. And what we know with their first year out, that's gonna be their lowest earnings amount. So we always have to acknowledge that. But that's around, let's say $3,000 a month. Then we can calculate the ratio between the $3,000 of gross income versus the $265 uh, for a payment, uh, which I think is much more digestible uh, when we take that out to the public than trying to account for, is it at least 60%? It gets a little confusing. And so that, that first ratio for that first year would be around 8.8% um, of their gross income going towards their monthly loan repayment. Next slide, please. And this, is all, this is all pre-tax. This, this is, is all pre gross pre-tax. Yeah, yes, sir. So that's something that's uh, complicated. So what's interesting is students, when I was meeting with them with focus groups, they would ask me, well, that's gross. That's not the adjusted of how much, you know, the federal government's going to take out on tax. And, and they said, well, can you calculate that for me? And I said, uh, I, I don't know your situation, right? I don't know how many dependents you have. I don't know your tax liabilities. Um, but I said, this is a start. And I, I, I and that's what I, I think about is this is a foundational piece to start with. And then we can start untangling you know, adjusted gross income versus uh, gross income. But that's a, that's a great, ex that's an excellent point. Right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, some, we just have to acknowledge some possible limitations. I think once again, um, the gross income could be a possible limitation. I think uh, we have to have required reported earnings uh, for students to uh, make this metric uh, feasible. Uh, we can create estimates to understand how much by program students are making and create those estimates as well. We also, there are also various reasons for why there might not be earnings. So we know that if they graduated, but they're pursuing additional credentials and they're not working, they won't be in those data set. And the, those loan debts will be deferred if they are continually enrolled. Um, they might be self-employed. So we don't have 1099 records in the workforce data, the unemployment insurance wage records. Uh, we know that there's some limitations with the Texas data 
because we don't account for military and we don't account for the US Postal Service. Um, the students might have left the country, they might have left the state, uh, they might be out of work or unemployed, or they might not even be looking for work. And so we have to paint that account as well. We also have to take into account differences in cost of living. We know that there can be dramatic differences, whether you live in Austin versus Houston versus Dallas versus El Paso or Tyler. And so we have to acknowledge that there would be differences. And then we also have to acknowledge the supply and demand impacts within a given region of the state. So if there is, let's say, for example, there's a saturation and the number of um, workers in a certain field, there might be a lower pay um, allocated to those other than another metric or another region where it might be in high demand. And so there needs to be a higher paid salary to recruit individuals there. But I think, once again, I think this is a foundational piece of really trying to move the needle to understand the credentials of value. And to my knowledge, there really aren't other states tackling this type of phenomenon of trying to determine credentials of value looking at debt to income ratios. And so there's some, next slide please. There's some actionable items associated with this. I think what's exciting about this is we can truly monitor debt levels by institutional type, by program, and also student demographics. Because we do know that there are certain areas where there are majors where they're not making as much as an engineer. Keep in mind, we, we can't have all students graduate with an engineering degree, right? That would, that would saturate the field um, and not everyone's interested in engineering. And so we have to think about how we can monitor the different types of degrees we're offering and the debt levels associated. I think another area is thinking about the strategic financial aid packaging that can happen um, across the state, across the nation, and within the institutions to think about how we can subsidize and lower those costs when we know that there are some debt to income ratios that are, might be out of control. Um, we also have to think about how we enhance the value of socially impactful credentials and occupations. We have to have pre-K teachers. We have to have K through 12 teachers, social workers, healthcare workers, counselors, artists, musicians, um, to cr create that social impact that they do have on our lives. I mean, during COVID, we've truly seen how social workers can play a role and counselors can play a role with mental health being isolated during the, the COVID environment. And then I, I think that the other opportunity is if we look at the debt to income ratios, exploring opportunities to enter, introduce micro credentials that could enhance the value of those degrees and truly help those students have the skills needed to um, get the best opportunities for making the highest earnings, but also lowering their debt at the same time. Next slide, please. And so with that, that's the metric, but then there's some next steps to think about to give, go even more complex. I, I always like to start with a foundational piece and then build our way up to a scaffolding approach. And one way we can do that and to the left is thinking about a break even point. Thinking about the cumulative earnings of college graduates minus the net tuition payments and foregone earnings. So there are opportunity costs associated with pursuing a degree. Um, you're less likely to work full time um, and you're, you're, you're not getting that uh, real, the work experience you might need um, as compared to a high school student who goes directly into the workforce. And so what we can do statistically is we can use the data to start um, examining the investment in higher education. So this would be sort of the cost of attendance minus any grants and scholarships. And then also think about the foregone earnings that you, you're, you're out of by being fully enrolled. And then you can compare and contrast those investments versus what a high school graduate is making and follow them over time as well to see where, at what point do they break even and then exceed. So the graphic um, below is showing you those in yellow are bachelor's degree recipients and figuring out at what age did they surpass both associates and high school graduates? And what type of gap uh, differs exist over time because it should create a cumulative effect. And then on the right is thinking about thresholds. This is thinking about the Gates Foundation's work of 
how we can compare and contrast. So you can use the American Community Survey data to better understand how much Texans are making by educational level. And then we can compare and contrast that level versus what our current graduates are making once they go into workforce. So it can really help us hone in to figure out how successful our students are. And not only that, but also think about how that might differ by gender, by race, ethnicity, and by major. Next slide, please. Oh. So now I just wanna open up the floor to see if you had any questions or responses on what I've said so far. So I got a question. At the end of the day, this was a great presentation, complex. I guess my basic question is, so what? If you go back to your second slide, it says in 2019, 41% of young adults believe a college education is very important compared to 74% in 2013. That is a precipitous drop. Who's finding out why they think that? Where, where's the answer to that question? I don't see that in here. That's a, that's a great question. I mean, what I want to do is create focus groups to really understand what's happening. I, I, right now, I, I'm challenged because I have a biased sample when I'm talking to already college students. So they've already accepted, they're going through the process and they are college students. I need to work with K through 12 or we need to work with K through 12 to understand the missed opportunities of students who decided not to go um, to college. That, I mean, that's an excellent point. Um, that's, that's the multi-billion dollar question about why. So I, I, I'm so glad that you brought that up. Well, and we need to answer it. And, and, and not only that, we need to understand <clears throat> that for these young people, what we're calling perception is in fact reality. And what we need to find out is why is that their reality? And we need to address that. All these studies are great. I think we know what the outcome is going to be. If you, if you have a credential of value, you're going to earn more over your lifetime. But that's not the reality from 2019 to 2013 for these people. So why is that? And what can we do to address that? Absolutely. And I think we're starting, I mean, in, 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 and this is probably the case of, potentially why community college enrollments <laughs> drop dramatically. We need to figure out what's happening um, with students or with high school students. Absolutely. Thank you for that. I, I think uh, Mr. Torrance brought up a good point. I think you did, Dr. Troutman, a very good job of laying out the concern. Um, and then the credentials of value are, are very important. Maybe we need to define and look where the workforce um, commission and look at where those jobs are and really kind of educate the students and the parents about the needs of the positions and that define those credentials that are of value because uh, we know that there's an issue, but be more specific. I think that's what Mr. Torn is saying about how do we solve the problem and that being uh, specify specifically where those credentials are and what they are and how they meet the workforce needs of the state. So it seems that we, that it's a translation issue as well that, that um, Dr. Troutman has pointed out. We need to, obviously the way we're disseminating the information is not resonating uh, with the students. So it seems like some sort of, uh, Dr. Keller, some sort of you know, student focus group, uh, high school students, college students, and, have, and, and kind of have them come up with a methodology that resonates uh, in the terms that they understand, because to me it's simple. If if um, I get this credential, I'm likely in this in these fields to make $500 a month more. This, I will, I will, in order to do that, with with all the tools available, uh, I am likely to need so much of student debt, and the monthly payment of that student debt is $264. So therefore, I'm good by $250, and at some point. The student debt's paid off, uh, so it seems like some sort of uh, just reverse engineer from the student level focus groups, and then for us to develop some sort of tool that, just like they have in every other industry, where you just start answering questions, where do you live, what, in, what fields you're interested in, what schools you're looking at, and, and, and 
tie that to workforce data and kind of make that easy to, enter, you know, to where at the end of that, uh, them going through that, it's clearly obvious in, you know, in their language and their terms that it makes sense. Uh, my other question is, is it uh, obviously we're losing the Google search battle. Uh, so, A, do we need, are we, are we and the universities not proactively putting out our own information that would fall to the top? Because uh, it, it sounds like all they're hearing, you know, you know, if you Google search, you know, you're only good for a couple of pages and then you give up after uh, after that. And so how do we how do we make sure it seems like we're not doing a good enough job of of keeping that data fresh and in in front of the students. So uh, like I said, we're open uh, for ideas. So Dr. Keller, do you have any thoughts on? Yeah. So let me make sort of three three quick points. Uh, first, just to, um, uh, but before before I do that, I, I do want to say um, publicly how much we deeply appreciate the partnership. Uh, with Dr. Troutman and his team at uh, at the UT system, and, and appreciate uh, the chancellor's uh, support in and uh, and uh, uh, allocating some of their time and and their expertise uh, to assist us. So we have we have the benefit of incredibly rich data in Texas, uh, but also um, have the benefit of working with the folks who are recognized across the country as as the. Uh, working on the frontiers of these issues, including Dr. Traubman. So I, I, I really appreciate uh, their their uh, support uh, for this uh, important work. So, so, so th three quick things. First, to underline um, a point that David made about this general context, where we have um, uh, this precipitous drop in perceptions of the value and, and also how accessible higher education is going to be. At the same time, what we see um, is that the data is um, clear that higher education has become increasingly essential for the new jobs that are being created. So, so this drop in confidence at the same time that it's becoming even more important uh, for students to uh, acquire education beyond high school. Uh, so there's, there's this deep tension there. Um, that accelerated during the pandemic. So, uh, so confidence dropped further during, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, community college enrollments in particular and enrollments at our uh, broad access regional universities dropped, especially for black students, Hispanic students, first generation students, low income students in general. Um, that's, uh, uh, so that, that creates a, a vulnerability for those students. It creates a vulnerability uh, for our state. In that, so in response, um, so we're proposing to uh, the board to put a marker down that we need to set two important guardrails in our in our state goals. First, to be much clearer about that we're going to focus on the on credentials that are of value to individuals, not just sort of making up goals, counting whatever kind of credential, but having a much better sense of what the value is, what the demand is in in our uh, uh, Texas labor market in particular. And then the other guardrail is on student debt, that uh, how much debt is too much debt is going to vary depending on what kind of credential you have in, in particular. And uh, so we, the second point is, um, as, as David alluded to, a lot of the information that we've provided to students uh, clearly has been inadequate. So when we say we're going to set a target at 60% of your first-year wages being a threshold for, our, for debt goal, um, it's it's hard to explain what that means in practice, or why a student should care, or why a policymaker should care. So we need to first of all, we need to make our debt a lot, a debt goal a lot uh, clearer and more intuitive for students. Um, but uh, but we need to provide information in a way that uh, that high school students, that their counselors, their families are going to be able to consume. Um, the narrative out there is. Toxic. The narrative out there that uh, just a quick the quick Google search that, uh, that that David shared about the narrative is that debt is out of control, higher education is inaccessible, that the credentials aren't uh, really of value, and students uh, take out a ton of debt and end up with a mortgage and no house. Um, that's um, 
that's not accurate for the vast majority of our students. And but it feeds this perception that that higher education is out of reach. That's not for them, especially for the first generation college students. So, so we've got a failure of information uh, that we that we need to address. Um, the third point is that because of the changes that the legislature made in this last session and because of the resources entrusted to us um, by the governor and the legislative leadership, the coordinating board is uniquely well positioned among uh, any of um, any similar entities across the country where we have a broad in charge to work on these issues, not only to set the goals, but a broad in charge around student advising, around um, uh, targeted investments in financial aid and uh, digging more deeply into what's going to work and what's going to be more effective. Um, I will say that in, 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 uh, it, when we work with folks in higher education, we tend to th always think that the problem is just an information problem, and if we could just explain it better or teach it better, then, then we would solve the problem. It's much deeper than that, and I, and I think that's, that's uh, David alluded to that when he showed what earnings look like over time and, and uh, that there's some complex uh, dynamics that are underway. We know that um, the students who are opting out of higher education right now uh, generally are working. Uh, so students are choosing to work um, and take entry-level jobs because there's a lot of demand for in, in, in entry-level jobs right now. Wages are high there, um, but the trajectory for that is not good over time. It's, um, so even, even when we present the data and say, well, here's what your earnings are going to look like when you're 30 and 40 and 50, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't pay the bills right now. That doesn't uh, help students address their needs and their families' needs right now. And um, so we, we also have to not fall into the trap of saying, well, if we could just provide the better advising tools and, we'll, and, and make this more intuitive and help the institutions understand, there's gonna, we, we need to uh, be uh, ready to address the issues in ways that are much more comprehensive. So, for example, uh, work with the institutions to make sure that we're uh, engaging low-income students and addressing the full range of their needs, that we're understanding what are those factors that are leading students to stop out and drop out? How do we make sure that students are going to stay on track and engaged? Um, so we're we're committed to working on that, and we have unique tools available. So so this just one step is to update and align our goals with what the state really needs. But then we we're setting the stage through these other strands of work to work work much more comprehensively. Yeah, I get that. I think two quick points. First of all, the reality for someone who is underrepresented from a low-income home, single parent or no parent home, is much different than the reality of others. And so I think it's very important to not just get a broad understanding of what perception and reality is, but to get a very targeted understanding of that particular socioeconomic group. And the second thing I would say is this, look, Mr. Wilson mentioned Google. To an 18-year-old, Google is old news. To you and I, you know, I give welcome credit at our age. We're pretty good at Google. I'm, I'm, we're great. We're tech savvy. To an 18-year-old, they get all their information from Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. That's where it comes from. And that's where their perceptions are created. That's where their realities are created. And we have to understand that. It doesn't do us any good to publish a paper. It doesn't, you know, it just, we, we have to do a better job of understanding how young people receive their information and how they assimilate it in that regard. And Sam said exactly what I was going to allude to, that our competition is TikTok. It's not the regular, traditional get a job. You have the social media influencers who are making a lot of money. I don't know how it works. I'm still trying to figure that out. But they do make a lot of money just filming how you put on your makeup or, you know, just really weird things. So our competition is not the regular um, go out, get a job 24-7. It is the how do I do it in, I like to say, the elevator-type 
fashion where I can tell you what I do in 30 seconds and make $1,000 every time I tell you how to do it. So that's our competition. The second thing is, are we defining debt? Does debt mean, you know, books and tuition, or does debt mean I took out a loan but I didn't pay for my course, I furnished my apartment? Is that considered, you know, separate debt, or are we calling it, um, you know, student tuition debt versus I spent the money on something else debt? Yeah, are we separating those two? Well, that's an important point uh, because uh, we we have a window on the student loan debt. Um, we don't have a we don't have a, a great window on how they use that, um, and and we know that there's an issue both with debt and with the grant aid when students get a lump sum allocation. There are students who will send a chunk of money home, or there are students who will who will um, who will uh, blow through their um, uh, their 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 grant aid or their student loan in the first half of the semester and run out of money. Um, we also don't have a window on their credit card debt, um, and uh, which which is increasingly an issue. So in in this context, we've just uh, we're trying to hone the kind of advice um, and analyses we do around student loan debt. But there is this there is this broader picture around that. I do have a question for um, uh, Dr. Trotman. Um, in your slides, you said that from 2013 to 2019, that's before the pandemic, the favorability of going to college jobs so so significantly. Um, have you have any data uh, at least show um, the real data show that what are the main reasons? You know, we can always speculate. You know, social media and all that stuff. But you do you have a real data to show that is it the college is become harder or it's hard to, or the, or the high school preparation is not enough, things like that nature. That why, why is so dramatic in terms of the, the number, the percentage in terms of favor, favoring going to college? Excellent point. I, I think that uh, this goes back to um, another board member mentioning, really getting in there and thinking about the qualitative data and understanding and capturing the student voice Right now, I don't have any qualitative data that will provide you reasons for why there's a dramatic decline, but I think that we need to do our due diligence to ensure that we're capturing the high school voice so that we can better understand that question. I, I, I don't have an answer for you, so I'm, I'm sorry for that. Thank you. But it, and also, but it seems like that data, the whole world has changed uh, due to COVID, and so the way people operate in the workplace and in their private lives has all changed. So we would, we, we really kind of need to understand how that's affected everything uh, as well. Ms. Fine, do you have any, I'm sure you have ideas or thoughts on, because it's a, if, this, if we were a business, we would be in, uh, in battle mode uh, because we, you know, we, we need to help the industry figure this out uh, because it's obviously going the wrong direction. Right, and I think as many of you have pointed out, it's not, it's not one thing. Right, it's an approach that uh, that uh, a diversified approach to number one, understanding the problem and the particular needs of particular populations that we're trying to reach, but also being realistic about what role we can play as the agency and what how we should partner with our institutions to play an increasingly effective role at getting students, you know, sharing the value proposition of higher education, which is part of what this metric is uh, aimed at doing. Right helping people understand, if I take this step, will I be better off and how will I be better off over time in my, uh, in my career and in my life? So I think there's a number of things, and you'll hear about a few of them actually tomorrow. We'll be talking about on course, uh, and you'll hear about it, uh, a few of, uh, of the other uh, items that we have on the drawing board for, uh, via procurements to start to address some of, these, some of these gaps that we see in student understanding and in uh, our ability to serve them information that's meaningful and helps them make decisions. I mean, it seems like state leadership is behind this 100% and, and would, would provide us whatever tools are necessary to roll this out. So it, I think it's probably our responsibility to take the lead on this uh, with the support of state leadership uh, and, you know, to kind of figure it out. 
in best you know in a best practice kind of manner and help the inst- you know, with the help of the partners and the workforce commission and the institutions and and kind of get this show on the road sooner than later it seems like I think that's an important point to underline is that in in Texas and when I I spent a lot of time talking with colleagues across the country about their their context what they're wrestling with um, governor the legislative leadership uh, are strongly behind us as we move in this new direction uh, we uh, also uh, want to call out the strong partnerships we have with our systems with our institutions with our uh, uh, both our four-year and our two-year institutions, um, and with our tri-agency partners. So in our new tri-agency workforce goals, um, you'll see right there uh, uh, the endorsement of the new goals from the, the coordinating board. So we've got, a, from a policy perspective, we've got this unique window where we've got support and we have resources. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an urgent, complex enormous uh, problem to tackle uh, that we've uh, that the uh, right now nobody's got a great answer uh, for how we're going to engage and re-enroll as many students as we know have opted out of higher education over the past two years but that's going to be one of the most important um, issues that uh, that that we uh, that we could work on right now is uh, that we have uh, tens of thousands of students who opted uh, not to participate in higher ed. They're disproportionately low-income students, first-generation students, black students, Hispanic students. Um, And we've seen the issue not just with students not opting to enroll directly in high school, but um, but at a number of our campuses, the problems are really students not coming back um, because they are... uh, they are opting to work instead of re-enrolling. And, and I agree with uh, Ms. Williams and Mr. Torn that it, it's not one size fits all. We need to really drill down for each demographic group and come up with a way to uh, communicate. Any other questions uh, from the committee? I, I, do, I do look forward to Mr. Torn's TikTok um, uh, uh, preview uh, that we'll all follow with uh, <laughs> with a lot of interest. Great. Thank you, um, Dr. Troutman, Ms. Fine. We appreciate uh, your, this is very informational and and uh, we need to, we need really a call to action and, and get on with it, seems like. Thank All you. right, we will move on to agenda item 5B is an update on data modernization innovative. Ms. Lori Fye, Deputy Commissioner of Data Analytics and Innovation, will provide a presentation and be able to answer any questions. And this item is for information only as well. Yes, and good morning, Mr. Vice Chair and committee members again. Uh, It will be a hard act to follow, that very engaging conversation, but I'll do my best. And I do have some show and tell as part of today's update, so I'm very excited about that. I'm Lori Fai, and I'm privileged to serve in this role as Deputy Commissioner of Data Analytics and Innovation, and I'm here to give you our quarterly update on the Data Modernization Initiative. Next slide, please. I always start here. Um, because this continues to be the North Star that guides our work. The Commissioner's vision from the beginning was that we take this rich treasure trove of data that that we have at the core dating board and we we use that to better inform uh, our our stakeholders with actionable insight and data for decision making and that's continued to guide our work. The goals here that you see here also continue to guide the projects, the many work streams, Um, that we have underway, and in particular, I'll point out that we've had a dual focus on the back end, the technology and the technology infrastructure and the data architecture, while also having a strong focus on delivering user value, and we've done those in parallel intentionally, and um, I'm very excited. That makes it complicated because you would sometimes prefer to do those in sequence, but what, what that's... Uh, resulted in is our ability to actually show you some things that we'll be releasing very soon. Uh, And I'm excited to share a preview of that with you today. Next slide. Again, this is one you've seen before. This gives you some highlights of the milestones over the timeline. And uh, next slide. And this gives you an idea what we'll be working on through the summer. 
And this one has a lot of detail on it, so I'm not expecting you to read through it, uh, but I do want you to know so what, this calls out some of, the, some of the important work that's gotten accomplished already, the work that's in progress, and the work that we have slated through this summer. Uh, so in particular, I want to call out a couple of things. First, uh, as you'll see in the subse in, in, uh, subsequent slides, we are preparing for our first internal release of data dashboards that we're very excited about. These, these will have information on enrollment and credentials and degrees awarded. This is a very major milestone in this initiative because it's the first, um, this is the first output, data output that we'll be generating through the entire pipeline, which is now uh, in, the, in, the, in the cloud, is a cloud-based pipeline. So very exciting to us uh, to have that opportunity. We'll be releasing that internally for um, internal feedback, and then we'll be sharing that externally with stakeholders. We're also, uh, in the next couple of months, preparing to launch an, a refreshed agency website, um, which we're very excited about. Not only will it have the new branding, it, not only will it carry the new branding, but it will also be a greatly improved uh, user experience. Very excited about that, and also about a follow-on launch of a revised data site later in the summer, again, to help make the the work that, that helps us deliver on our goal to make the agencies work and our data more engaging, more user-friendly, and more useful. A key component of delivering on that user-friendliness is uh, related to delightful design, a really high-quality design and, user and um, engaging user experience. So we do have a procurement underway that's noted on this slide, and you'll be hearing more about that tomorrow at the board meeting to select a vendor to help us really uh, in, uh, implement, design and implement a high quality experience, uh, for, particularly for, for those who come uh, to explore our data products, because we have many. Uh, and today that's not an easy, that's not an easy journey. Uh, and so now I'll turn some so attention. So can I ask you a question? Sure. Who is the anticipated user? One of the complicated things about the, uh, about the agency is that we have a range of users. So we have users from students and families to uh, very data savvy institutional researchers. And so part of why we believe, part of why we're taking the step to engage a vendor to help us um, with this user design is that we have a, a, law, a broad cross section of users and we need to be able to support each of them in a way that's intuitive and engaging for them. Policymakers, internal staff, I mean we have a, we have a wide waterfront and I think that's, one of, that's definitely one of the challenges, because um, if we had one, we could deeply understand that one, but we actually have many, and we're working to serve those many in a way that's um, helpful to them. In follow-up to Warren's question, Ms. Fye, I get questions and calls from CEOs wanting to know about all this rich data we have. I mean, this is kind of an example of the previous presentation, I think, in that there's a lot of great work done, but how does it reach like Mr. Dorn says, the end user and people that can use this great information because I constantly get asked, how can I tap into data from the coordinating board? Um, because a lot of people don't know the rich data that we have other than a lot of our uh, colleagues around the country who are in higher education. Yeah, uh, this again, is it seems like a rudimentary simple thing, but I mean, there's we're, we do a lot of great work, but we need to work on, as you said, uh, with this great implementation and the work that you're doing and your team is, we need to let people know what we're doing and the end users know what's happening because um, we do get calls with workforce folks that want to know and how they can use this rich data. I would agree with you. And we, uh, in the agency and the data team, we field about 400 ad hoc data requests a year also, yeah. right, which is a significant number of one-on-one -on -one requests, which tells us we've got opportunities to make that data available in a e more easy to access and easy to understand um, uh, manner. And that's what exactly what we're about in this, in this work, so. Great, no, because yeah. I know that you're doing a lot of hard work, you and your team, and I wanna make sure that, you know, that we get that message across. So I know you're working on that, so we, we do appreciate that because it's, this is a lot of great work that y'all are doing, and this implementation mm -hmm. of this roadmap is very key to making sure that that message gets out. Very thank, good. Thank you, Dr. Phidias. But I think, so let's fast forward, go to the next slide, and I'll, uh, this is sort of a case in point, Dr. Phidias, to your, uh, to your question. 
we make a lot of data available on the website today. We have more than 300 reports at any given time. We provide an interactive system that allows users to, to uh, download data sets, but it's not very easy to navigate, and it's not very easy to find what you're looking for unless you're uh, a pretty um, experienced, unless you're pretty experienced in the Texas data. So a couple of things, uh, in most cases that, that output is a PDF report or it's a multi-tab spreadsheet like what you're looking at here. What you're seeing here is a fall, is a fall uh, enrollment spreadsheet that has separate tabs for things like institution type, gender, race, ethnicity, uh, all provided in separate tabs. Now this, to, to Mr. Torn's point, this type of output is suitable for certain audiences. Like data nerds like me love this. Institutional researchers like Dr. Troutman, they love this because they can download this data and have it for further analysis. It's not useful for every single user, though, that we, that we try to serve. And so, but this is where we are today, and uh, I want to give you a glimpse of where we're headed with this first release of dashboards on the next slide. So this, this is a snapshot using test data only, so none of this, don't draw any conclusions from the way the, the graphs actually look. Uh, but this is a snapshot of, of the enrollment dashboards that will be released to our staff in the next few weeks. These first dashboards are intentionally focused on the most frequently requested data. That is on enrollments, degrees and certificates awarded, and the next round of dashboards will be on graduation rates. Those, those are the top most frequently viewed and most frequently requested data. Folks will ask for it by certain slices. What we've done here by putting these into a visualization tool is given the user the ability to actually customize the information to meet their needs. So in this case, you can look at uh, fall enrollment for all institutions. You can look at it for a specific type of institution like community colleges or technical colleges. Or you can look at it for a specific institution over a certain, over, over a certain eight year ranges, over a specific year. And then you can, you can further customize uh, if you're interested in a particular population, like a gender, specific gender, specific race, ethnicity, classification, which is sophomore, junior, et cetera. And so you can easily uh, zero in on what it is that you're most interested in understanding. This, uh, you also have the, the, the ability to, to export the data with the click of a mouse or to leave us a comment about that so that you can say, hey, this is awesome, but what I could really use is this other dimension. Next slide, please. So that, that type of information allows you as an institutional leader or a regional, um, regionally interested and engaged uh, stakeholder to understand what's happening with trends and enrollment in your area. The, sec uh, the second piece of that is that we've actually also provided um, a view that's geographic in nature. So that allows you to see where, uh, by student, county, state, or country of residence, who's enrolling and where they're coming from. This view can help an institution's enrollment manager uh, start to identify opportunities for marketing to students based on where, where their students are coming from or where their students are not coming from that they would, that they would like, uh, that where they would like to market. It can also help a regional uh, initiative that's focused on education to workforce pipelines, understand where to focus their efforts. And these, these together, these enrollment dashboards will replace what is today about 17 reports on our website. So you can see that consolidating information in one place um, begins to improve the user experience. Next slide. This is a snapshot of the degrees and certificates awarded dashboard. Again, that's another one of the most frequently requested components of our data, and this gives a comprehensive view of the credentials that are attained by students in Texas institutions, again with multiple options for the user to customize the information based on what they're interested in. You see a geographic view here as well, um, again a way to support a more local understanding and local action. I mean, one of our goals is to make the data not just interesting, but actionable, and that starts to get at um, understanding what it looks like in the area that I care about. These initial dashboards will be undergoing some internal user testing over the next couple of months, and then we'll be uh, reaching out, out externally with our stakeholders to get, to get feedback. Slide. Another aspect, so those are, those are uh, improvements on the delivery, the provisioning of our data in ways that are user, 
uh, helpful and Im important to our uh, to our stakeholders. Another component that we are focused on, where we're focused on delivering value, is actually streamlining and automating the data submission process. If you talk to institutions um, about their data submission process, you will hear a lot of input about things we could be doing better. And this is a step in, uh, in that direction. Our first uh, submission process that we've tackled is the financial aid data system submission process. We're very excited about this. And what you're seeing here is the, newly, the new fully online submission portal. And while this is starting with the financial aid data system submission, it will ultimately house the submission processes for all of the data and the documents that the agency takes in for reporting and regulatory purposes. So we're very excited about that. One of the key improvements for the financial aid data system is that it actually moves part of the process out of email. Today, there's a component of the process that's handled via email. You can imagine how fraught with, you know, complications that can be. Um, and we're very excited to be able to move that all into a centralized system where there's a complete record from start to finish about the, about the different aspects of the submission and certification process. This improved uh, submission process will be piloted with a small group of institutions uh, over the next couple of months and then rolled out to all institutions uh, later in the spring. And then subsequent submission processes will follow uh, later this summer. Next slide. That's a little bit of the, um, of the, of the easily visualized work evidence of progress. But there are some other things that I did want to uh, want you to know have been going on and are actually instrumental in us being able to, to provide those visualizations. And these, those are noted here on these slides. A couple of highlights that I wanted to call out. Um, first, all of those activities under data management and infrastructure represent a, a, an impressive body of work by our, by our internal and contractor development teams to create and manage a fully cloud-based data pipeline. This is this is common in many industries, uh, financial industry, healthcare. It's not common in education, and it's definitely uncommon in uh, state education agencies. And so we're really, that represents, it's, it, it can be um, easy to un underappreciate what has to happen in the background in order to make those visualizations possible, and that's an extraordinary amount of work. Uh, and between our internal teams and our contractors, that's more than 50,000 person hours so far. So a significant investment of time and effort uh, to make this to make this work, this vision a reality. Second, we are moving full speed ahead, um, as I as you can probably tell from the timelines. Um, I noted earlier that we will have a procurement that we'll be um, addressing, uh, bringing up with the board tomorrow, and we are ramping up on change management as we uh, as we prepare to actually launch these new processes. There, there are a number of internal changes and changes with our partners that we want to uh, manage intentionally and mindfully. So we're, uh, we're, working, we're working on that right now with the team from Deloitte, uh, which is going really well. And then we've also, since our last meeting, been able to provide more than two and a quarter million dollars directly to institutions who are also working to upgrade their reporting systems. So really happy to be able to put that, um, that money in the hands of institutions as they're working uh, alongside us to improve their ability to report information to us. Now, lastly, I just want to say this progress, uh, we're at a really important inflection point with this project because this, this, this first release is a momentous milestone for us. And it's, uh, this progress is, part, is possible because of multiple uh, very important partnerships. Uh, the, the partnership between the agency and the Higher Education Foundation resulted in very important early stage planning resources that got us off to a strong start and continue to accelerate our work. The partnership between the governor's office and legislative leadership and the commissioner has invested more than $15 million to make this vision a reality, uh, and we continue to enjoy that support. Our partnership with institutional leaders and other stakeholders have, has been important. They've been very generous with their time and insight to help us be, uh, detail out what's most valuable to them. To Mr. Torn's, Torn's questions about who's the user, I mean, we've, we've been intentional about reaching out, particularly to our, uh, our data user stakeholders to get their insight that helps us both define, our, define what we'll deliver, but also help prioritize and sequence that work. And then last but certainly not least, our ongoing partnership across our internal teams 
our ISS department, procurement, legal, data, the data teams, project management and improvement office, as well as with our contractors, continues to be the engine of our progress. And I just want to take this moment to publicly thank them for their, for their work to date and for their ongoing commitment to, to realizing this vision. It's, it's very exciting. Uh, I hope the next time we talk about this, you all actually have your own hands-on opportunity to see what, uh, what we're making available. And that concludes my uh, report. Again, this is for information only, but I'm happy to take any questions. Well, great. I can tell it's a, an, an enormous amount of effort uh, to undertake this, and we really appreciate you and your team's effort to uh, roll this out because it's 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 a it's a huge production, and and uh, I think you're hitting on all the right points. Uh, one thing that uh, I think is important is is I'd like to see some sort of robust rollout plan once we produce the web, website. You know, what is our plan to not just hope that people realize it's there and use it, but are we going to reach out to all the stakeholders and institutions and help walk them through it and show them how their life is easier as a result of this? Uh, so if you could just, uh, at a future meeting, you know, kind of come up with a plan, uh, you know, some sort of rollout uh, uh, feature here that will really get in the hands to where people are actually uh, using it. The other other thing we ought to focus on is do we is part of this technology to where we can track who's using it and what areas they're using it for so we can get live uh, real time data as to who's using it and and as important who's not using it that that uh, should be uh, I do like the dashboard approach uh, that's informative and simple and then for the you know I think you call them data nerds, they can always come back and request, you know, deeper dive uh, beyond that. But really, I, I feel like our job is to provide this information to the stakeholders, institutions, and partners, and the legislators so that they can make uh, informed decisions. So thank you very much. Thank you for those for those uh, comments. Too. Right. Any other questions or comments? I need a clarification, and I, I don't mean to beat a dead horse. <clears throat> what role does this agency play in communicating with or interacting with the end user, that low-income potential student? What is our role? Do we expect them to come to us at some point directly ever, or is that all done at, you know, segmented local institutions and stuff? So, um, so it's a, a great question. So it's a First, just to kind of level set, especially for the new members. So we're the we're the stewards of this combined educational and workforce data, um, and so we've got multiple end users. We've got the end users within institutions where we want to reflect back data that's more granular um, and uh, and with tools that they don't have available, especially at smaller institutions uh, that that don't have um, the institutional research capabilities. Um, that the larger ones do. Um, we've got the public, uh, so as we adopt new goals and the public is going to need to see where we are, our policymakers are going to need to see where we are. Um, but to your point, Mr. Torn, it's, it's also, um, especially given the changes that the legislature made this last session around advising, that gives us a direct charge more on the end user being students and their families and leveraging this data to power new advising tools for uh, students so that they've got a clear line of sight to here's uh, institutions that might be an option uh, given my interests, um, here's what the path looks like there, um, here's what the potential upside would be, uh, that, those kinds of things. And so that's um, especially under the umbrella of what we're doing with Texas on course and then what the new My Texas Future uh, intake portal uh, that we're working on, that's that's going to be um, importantly connected to all of this work on data infrastructure so that we're not just providing general information about like the value of college, but where we can increasingly personalize that guidance for individual students. Um, and and uh, that again, remember we're 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 reaching directly with texting through the AdB chatbot. Uh, we were texting with a quarter of a million students.
students. I think uh, this last fall, um, we've already got advising tools that we've rolled out through the high school counselors and in partnership with the high school counselors. Um, but uh, but on the roadmap will be more and more tools um, that are curated for students so that they can understand why this is relevant to them and how they're going to get from here to there. So that said, <clears throat> I think it's very important what Mr. Wilson said is, you know, we have to have a tools to drive people yep. to the website, okay? The data nerds, they're going to know it's there. They're going to be willing to click through 10 things to find what they want, okay? If we're actually going to interact with the end user, we have to be driving them there through these modern means of communication. And once that person gets there, two to three clicks and they're gone. We have to understand that. They're not going to click 10 times to find what they want. So I think that's very important. I can agree more, Mr. Torn and Mr. Wilson. We are acutely aware that just because we build it does not mean they will come. Right, and so uh, we've um, we'll be we'll we will we are at work. I mean, the change management plan is a component of a rollout plan. It's not a complete one, but we will for, for each of these uh, types of tools where there's a specific audience in particular that we want to reach. We'll, we uh, we're investing time and and resources to build campaigns that that actually reach the folks, not people who look like me, but the folks that that that, that the tools are intended to support. Sounds like we have a you know kind of a charge from the leadership to reach you know down to the end user, not just to the institutions and hope. And a lot of the a lot of the smaller institutions don't have the resources. Uh, really, if you look at their budgets, it's it's you know it's 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 thin, and, and they, they don't have the you know. So we we really need to help them help their students. So any way to go directly to those students, uh, I think that's. Uh, probably our should be our mission and responsibility. Yeah, and, and just to emphasize that, that point on the uh, with the institution. So, some of our larger institutions have they've got fairly sophisticated institutional research shops where they they're using predictive analytics to try to understand where students are stopping out, dropping out, and focus their student uh, success efforts. Uh, majority of our institutions are not like that. They don't have those kind of capabilities. And in particular, the majority of our institutions don't have capabilities to work with labor market information. So, um, so the the vision we're driving towards is where the tool set that we'll be able to provide through the through the coordinating board will help institutions have a better sense of what's happening with what are the profiles like of their incoming students, what are those needs like, where are students getting hung up, what uh, kinds of jobs are their students getting. Uh, what are those career trajectories like? What's the what's the shape of the debt look like for students um, at their institutions compared to the rest of the state? That's not information that's easy for them to get access to uh, today. So we've got so that's an important set of end users for us um, uh, when Lori's talking about making sure that this is this is going to be useful to the stakeholders uh, because the majority of our institutions. Uh, they're going to be focused. They've been focused more on sort of compliance reporting, um, and uh, and and we haven't made that easy for them in how they submit the data. So this is this is an important um, kind of next uh, iteration of sort of the mission of the of the agency and how we can uh, be a resource and partner with our institutions. Great. Well, great effort. Keep up the good work. Thank you, uh, Thank you so much. I have a question. I have a quick, yes, quick question. How far back are we going? I know we've been collecting data for years and years and years. How far back are we going? We are starting with a, a, about 10 years of data, but we, our goal is to go back as far as we can, as far as is feasible. I mean, obviously, we want the ability to monitor trends. Because we have 30-plus years of data, um, we do want the ability to look at those trends over a variety in a variety of dimensions, and so we will ultimately we ultimately plan to have all of it uh, in in the new infrastructure in the data lake. Okay. The other thing is, I think we are uh, what they're asking is, can, are we making the data sticky? <laughs> mean meaning when you go to the site, you'll you know you'll stay there and you know you'll find stuff of interest and keep digging, digging, digging. So 
Yeah, we, we'll uh, make it Mr. to Mr. Wilson's point about analytics, I think we will definitely be ramping up our, our ability to monitor utilization so that we really do have a better insight of what should come first. Like, what do people want to see first? You know, we'll start, we've started with what we, what, what we frequently get requests for and what, what our site analytics today tell us people uh, look for most frequently. But there's, that's not, you know, that's just the starting place. So building in mechanisms to be sure that we constantly refresh the information and, and uh, adjust according to what users need, tell, show us that they need, mm -hmm. uh, is definitely a part of the, that's definitely part of the construct of the overall plan. That's the great thing about technology. It great. can tell you everywhere you've been. <laughs> yeah. I know when I buy something online, it's hard to get off, it's hard to get a clean getaway before they offer me other opportunities <laughs> to, <laughs> to spend exactly. money. Any other questions from the committee? Great, thank you thank for your Thank you so much. Thank you for your help. All right, so we will move on before I get the hook from the ladies over here. Um, agenda item 5C is consideration of approval of the data report required by Texas Education Code Section 51.4033 and Section 51.4034 related to non-transferable credit and transfer courses. Uh, members, due to the timing of the reporting collection, this report is expected to be finalized in February for submission to the legislature by March 1, 2022. The coordinating board staff requests that the board delegate authority to the Commissioner of Higher Education to approve and submit the data report to the governor's office and the legislature as soon as it is finalized. Uh, Dr. Melissa Humphreys, Director of P through 16 Data Analytics and Research is available uh, for any questions. Uh, so this is a recommendation and request by the staff so that we can uh, respond timely uh, to the governor's office and the legislature. Any questions? If not, uh, is there a motion to delegate authority to the Commissioner of Higher Education to approve and submit the data report to the governor's office and legislature by the March 1, 2022 Due date. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Thank you. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second, Mr. Torn. Uh, any discussion? Uh, members, when I call your name, please state whether you are for or against. Those in favor say aye. Those opposed say no. Mr. Klimmer? Aye. Dr. Frias? Aye. Mr. Gaunt? Aye. Mr. Torn? Aye. Dr. Wong? Aye. Uh, thank you, and myself, welcome Wilson, is, um, votes aye. Uh, the motion passes uh, by unanimous uh, vote. We will uh, move on to agenda item 5D, is a report on Financial Aid Advisory Committee activities. Denise Welch, Chair, and Ed Caressley, press, uh, past chair of the Financial Aid Advisory Committee, are joining us today and will present a summary of the Advisory Committee's recent activities and will be available to answer any questions. And this item is for information only. Welch? Yeah, this is uh, Ed Caressley, uh, Director of Financial Aid and Scholarships at Angelo State University. Uh, I serve uh, currently as the past chair of this committee and have been tasked with providing uh, this report. Um, I wanna continue on a theme that I've heard as, as I've uh, been uh, on this, uh, meeting uh, of partnership and just want to acknowledge what I would consider and I think those of us in the financial aid community consider a uh, important and valuable partnership that we have uh, with the coordinating board in um, providing access and success to our students through the financial aid resources that are available in the state and the role that this financial aid advisory committee plays in uh, 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 making that partnership work. Um, along with this theme of partnership, uh, I've often talked about how is it that students and their families pay for college, and it's a partnership. That partnership exists between the student and their family, the federal government, the state, the institution, and then there may be other sources as well of financial assistance. And uh, what I've often said is if each of those partners understand what their part in helping to pay for colleges and do their part, uh, college is possible and success is possible. 
And so um, I do uh, want to acknowledge how important um, the state's role in that partnership is uh, to assist families and students, especially those with limited resources to be able to access and have success in college. Um, wanna just uh, summarize a little bit uh, uh, some of the activities of the committee over this past year. Um, first of all, I wanna just kind of maybe acknowledge uh, the uh, elephant in the room and that's COVID and uh, just how COVID has uh, uh, affected uh, not only the work of this committee, but uh, uh, the work that we have within financial aid. Um, certainly it's changed how we do business. Um, and uh, that's uh, represented by the fact that this committee uh, met virtually uh, during our quarterly meetings in this last year. Um, and it would appear that we'll continue to meet virtually at least uh, for some period of time, not only because of COVID, but because of some of the efficiencies and opportunities that that creates. Um, it certainly changes how we serve our students and the needs of students. Um, and that's been uh, certainly effect uh, in this last year. Um, there's certainly been uh, some uh, sense of what we have available in the way of resources to assist students. So um, the infusion of money to assist students through um, the HER funds uh, that came directly from the federal government uh, to institutions um, and those dollars focused to provide grant assistance to students. Um, the funds that have come through the GEAR funds that have come through the state. Uh, certainly our new uh, of, uh, of, uh, avenues of resources that we currently have administered. And so not only have that created some opportunities, uh, certainly there have been some challenges as well um, to administer uh, some different funds um, and appreciative of uh, the work with the coordinating board uh, to assist in that, as well as with this committee um, kind of being uh, a place where uh, some of that uh, can be discussed and, and, and we can work together. Um, certainly, uh, it's affected the needs uh, of our students, um, the financial needs that they have. Um, and so, you know, certainly uh, that's been a reality. And so um, those are just some acknowledgements with COVID that exist. Um, but, but in that, I think uh, the good news that I would say is we've continued to be able to serve students and uh, even serve students in different ways. And uh, even though certainly there have been um, uh, some changes in enrollment patterns and all of that of students that um, uh, we, we continue um, you know, to, to uh, provide educational opportunities in the state of Texas and provide resources to help those students access those resources over the years. Uh, just a few things to summarize again, uh, what we've got, uh, they're listed on uh, the presentation slide that is next here. Um, uh, one thing I would mention is uh, uh, we, we um, worked uh, over the, uh, the year with uh, the new requirement that existed for all students graduating from high school to complete the FAFSA. Um, and so that has, has been a theme, um, you know, although not directly the responsibility of aid administrators, um, that partnership that we have with high schools and counselors um, uh, is something that exists uh, and, and uh, how that information then is shared um, and, and all of that has been something that we've, we've uh, uh, provided uh, uh, input and, and received also uh, information on, on how that process is going um, and you know, excited to see what opportunities exist there as we have more students completing the FAFSA um, which may remove wow. uh, a potential barrier and provide some motivation for students uh, to consider education if they haven't. Um, another uh, kind of task uh, uh, or, or thing that we work throughout the year um, is to uh, uh, bring on, and you know, this will be happening in the future, but the uh, TASFA application, which is the application that is used by um, uh, undocumented students who graduate from high school who aren't eligible for federal aid, but are eligible for state aid, um, that that form uh, in the work that is being done to provide some guidance um, to have this online uh, option available um, in this next, not this coming year, but in, in the next year um, and in the way uh, for those students to complete that application process in one place uh, very similar to the FAFSA application with the federal government uh, versus an individual application 
uh, to the institutions that they're considering. And so uh, excited about uh, uh, the continued progress towards uh, that being available and uh, opportunities to serve uh, that population. Uh, another area or theme uh, throughout the year was uh, uh, somewhat uh, precipitated by uh, the FAFSA simplification that took place at the federal level, uh, which changed not only uh, eligibility requirements uh, for students to have uh, receive uh, federal student aid, uh, but also uh, uh, coming up in the future, changing the calculation to determine financial need going from the EFC to uh, which is expected family contribution to the SAI, which is a student aid index. Um, some of the things that have been discussed there is this idea of alignment of eligibility um, between uh, federal programs and state programs, as well as even within state programs. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, with the changes that are taking place at the federal level, uh, probably as example in note one, no longer requiring selective service registration as uh, an eligibility requirement at the federal level um, and taking that uh, uh, information off of the FAFSA application and yet uh, having uh, that requirement still be part of uh, eligibility for state aid programs um, has uh, uh, provided uh, the, the need for us to be thinking and uh, appreciate the guidance that uh, we have received on how it is that we would uh, document that eligibility for state programs. But that misalignment between programs, um, you know, uh, is, is something that, uh, that uh, you know, we're, we're working to say, how do we do this in a ways that uh, both are um, efficient, but also uh, effective in uh, not providing barriers for students to qualify for all the aid that they could receive. Um, the last uh, thing that I would mention is, is just with the net price calculator. Um, uh, that the state uh, has uh, on the College uh, for All Texans website and schools providing that information. And again, with some changes at the, uh, um, of, of how uh, that information uh, was uh, uh, provided, uh, working with the coordinating board to come up with an alternate method to uh, submit the data that we need as institutions to then um, uh, meet that requirement at the state um, and have that uh, net price calculator out there uh, available to students is, is some work that we've done. Um, as we continue our work uh, going into the next year, uh, just uh, a little bit about uh, some recommendations uh, that we would give. Um, number one uh, would just say, continue to be aware of the gap that exists between the need of students that have been determined eligible by the state for financial assistance and the funds that are available uh, to assist those students. And um, you know, uh, seeing how uh, we can continue to uh, provide uh, or have more uh, support from the state um, to do uh, their part in this partnership uh, to, to assist the needs of students. Um, and, you know, but really uh, the message that I would like to give in, in kind of moving forward and in summarizing is just that um, uh, my belief is that this committee is a, a valuable uh, a partnership uh, and uh, uh, the work that we do with the coordinating board and those um, that are involved in, in the student aid area, I think is important. Um, we'll continue to meet and, and want to be a resource to the coordinating board, uh, kind of a sounding board as, as things continue uh, and have that um, and know that there will be continued work uh, with data collection, uh, with this task form and, and other subcommittee work that is done uh, to advance the cause of uh, providing funds and access and success uh, for our students. Um, and uh, finally, to uh, just uh, the role that, that we can play and continue to um, provide feedback uh, as, as well as uh, uh, be aware of the legislative process that's related to federal or to state student aid. Uh, finally, I would just like to uh, acknowledge my appreciation of the work uh, of Dr. Charles Contero Poltz. Um, who uh, uh, at the beginning of, of, of my role in, in being the chair uh, kind of helped lead this committee 
uh, from the, the coordinating board level. And now uh, does Shea Reed appreciate great uh, their uh, openness and always willingness um, to, 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 to work with us. Um, with that, we'll just uh, 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 give opportunity for any questions that either myself, uh, Denise Welsh, who is the current chair, uh, is, is on the call as well, but just respond to any questions you may have. Yeah, Mr. Mr. Gressley, this is um, the chairman, Dr. Velius. Um, thank you for the work. So you answered one of my questions is, uh, I guess you recommend continuing the committee and not sunsetting it, right? <laughs> But that is thank correct. you for okay um and then also uh, for, we have uh, several new board members and since it's the first time they've heard this report can you give us an idea of the uh, con of the committee um how people can be on the committee from institutions and then my follow-up question would be how can institutions have representatives that are not on the committee uh bring information and concerns about specific we were talking earlier about smaller institutions, larger institutions. What is the composition? This is just more informational for our new board members. If you could give us some background on that, please. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll try to explain. I mean, really the, the um, composition of uh, this financial aid advisory committee uh, is, is created by uh, the coordinating board, um, but it is through uh, a nomination process or a, a recommendation process um, where uh, institutions can nominate individuals uh, to, to serve on this. Um, we have representative not only of the financial aid community, but also uh, the high schools um, and even other uh, partners that are involved in um, uh, providing financial assistance to students. Um, but uh, they uh, seek to really create a, a committee that is representative not only geographically of the state of Texas, uh, but also representing the different uh, um, uh, sectors uh, within higher education um, to have that balance. And then one of the tasks that we have as uh, 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 board members is uh, really to represent not only our institution and probably not really uh, primarily our institution, but our sector um, that we represent um, and uh, uh, the the whole of uh, you know uh, uh, higher education funding, um, and so that's kind of one thing that I think we work to do to to, to make sure what hat we're wearing. I guess I would say uh, when we serve on the committee and not wearing our institution's hat, uh, but we're wearing you know the hat of uh, of serving uh, the whole uh, Texas um, community and students who are seeking to access um, and somewhat you know um, the unique aspects of the sector. Uh, that we're a part of. Um, have I answered your question completely? You, you have, thank you so much. I think it's important, uh, I appreciate you emphasizing that because when, when we do board orientation for our coordinating board members, you know, we also emphasize the same thing. Obviously we have a lot of decisions to make and we also want input uh, as, and that's why I think it's very important specifically, thank you to you and your committee and all the work that you do. And I see your incoming chair or current chairs here. So thank you, uh, Ms. Welch, right? and um, for being here as well. Um, but I just, I think, thank you for the work that you do. It's very important. And I think it's important to engage others that are not necessarily on the committee. Uh, so I'm glad to hear that, that you do that. Uh, we also, as coordinating board members, have to represent um, the whole state in our regions, and we emphasize that. We all have our alma maters and all, uh, and our favorite football teams, but that's another story. Uh, but we want to do the whole state, and we want to make sure we have representation from all areas. So thank you for, for the newer members giving that little background. I appreciate it. Thank you. Right. Any other questions from the committee? And to echo what uh, Chairman Freya said, we really appreciate your committee's work and effort because um, uh, it's all important information, and, and uh, I know it's not easy, and everybody's doing this as a volunteer, so we, we appreciate your time and effort on this, and it's much appreciated. All right, we will move on to agenda item six, which is adjournment. Do I have uh, a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. So moved, Mr. Sorn. Do I have a second? Second. Uh, I have a motion and a second. Members uh, indicate their uh, approval by saying aye. Those opposed say no. Uh, all those in favor of adjournment, please say aye. 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 Any no, hearing none, we are hereby adjourned. Thank you very much. Uh, we
Uh, the next uh, one is the Committee on Academic and Workforce Success. Uh, Ms. Williams, uh, we're going to take. Uh, we're going to take a, uh, Mr. Wilson. Thank you. We're going to take a five-minute break so the staff.